Well, thank you so very much. And I know like all of you, if you had to be quarantined, you'd rather be quarantined at a beach. I hope you enjoyed that little view there. Uh, beautiful nature. And we're going to talk about nature because we're going to talk about biological materials for pulpal vitality. And biological materials are natural, biocompatible materials that perform or augments or replaces a natural function. So in the old days, we thought about things being inert, very noble things such as gold that would never change. And so we were now looking at how can we augment the function for pulpal vitality. And so research and clinical protocols, as you know, I've been involved with research quite a bit. There's a little bit of a joke with the toe here touching the protocols. But as I mentioned, I'm Mark Cannon, and I'll give you a little history of myself right here. I'm a professor at Northwestern University and the research director at Anna Robert Laurie Children's Hospital Pediatric Dental Residency. So who I am, well, like I mentioned, I'm attending at Children's Hospital in Chicago. I do a lot of research, but most importantly, I'm a full-time private practitioner. I've been there almost 40 years, unbelievable. I got started in pediatric dentistry back in 1978. And when then in 1980 to start teaching at Northwestern University, many people remember me from there. Of course, I'm a diplomate and fellow of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry, but I'm also a fellow of the Academy of Dental Materials. I'm a fellow and on the executive board of the American Association, I'm sorry, the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. Five children, three grandkids. I love cooking and I love cars, barbecue, live music, beaches, and microbreweries. So the first moment we get out of quarantine, I'll find myself an open microbrewery. So here's my disclosure. I'm a consultant for a bunch of people, Lexington Pharmaceutical, GC America, Pulp Dent, Garrison Dental, Bisco, Claire, Tokiyama. I'm sorry if I've offended a few people by not mentioning them, but you don't get a lot of money by doing this because the reason I'm a consultant for so many groups is because of the fact I don't get really paid for it. I end up doing it for teaching purposes, for educational purposes. So, you know, it's uh, I have a honesty reputation. I'm brutally honest when it comes to how things work and don't work. And, and that's actually why a lot of the companies like me, I will tell them right away, I don't think this is going to be a good idea. And so they they like to hear that. So let's talk about that beach. Let's talk about calcium silicate. You know, tricalcium dicalcium silicate comes from limestone, diatomaceous earth. It's used in everything. You're probably in a building that has you know, cement, concrete in it, and that's Portland cement they use with all the aggregate fillers. And it even has been used as an anti-caking agent in food preparation. It's used as a safe food additive. It's used as an acid. It's safe. That's dicalcium, tricalcium silicate. And that's really the basis for a lot of biologic materials because that's a function that they take over like MTA and biodenting and others. They, they do remineralization. They're important for pulpal vitality. And we'll go through this stuff really quick because you guys know this, but like the original MTA was a Portland cement type one from the California Portland Cement Company. Slow set, gray color, mix of water. They really charge a lot of money for it. Eventually replaced by a white MTA, which is a type three. You look at the ingredients, you got your tricalcium silicate, dicalcium silicate being number one and two. And then uh, you have down there a little of your tricalcium aluminate and the tetracalcium aluminoferrite. And of course, some other things, calcium oxide, bismuth oxide was added to it to make it radiopaque. So that's an additive that was added into it. Uh, calcium sulfate, you guys work with that. That's plaster of Paris and aluminum oxide. It's the aluminum that has been a problem, as all of you are aware, especially the tetracalcium aluminum ferrite with the iron and discoloration. So we're, we're all aware of that. Little history on it. 
1993, Loma Linda got started working on the patent. In 1995, they got the patent. And in the patent, they said, hey, this is principally Portland cement, listing what we mentioned before, the tricalcium silica, dicalcium silica, and so forth. And this is actually a snapshot from the actual patent. If you go online and look at the patent, you'll see this nice snapshot. And it says right at that bottom line, you know, it's a type one Portland cement. It's a Colton Facet brand of the California Portland Cement Company. You go like, why? Well, because California was the first state to issue ash certificates for Portland cement. There was a concern in the 80s that people working with cement we're being exposed to bio burden and heavy metals that in Portland cement, there was a lot of contaminants. And if you're working on concrete roads or if you're working as a mason, you're working on Portland cement all the time, or even doing a bathroom and you get that stuff all over you, they were concerned about that being inhaled and what it would do to your lungs. And so right afterwards, by the way, Illinois followed requiring an ash certificate. So uh, Tor Benjad and so on uh, was starting to talk about 1993 as a root filling material. Hey, let's use this bioactive, this biological material uh, instead of using amalgam, you know, as a root filling. And then I was in Europe. I don't remember the meeting. I can. I vaguely think it was in Amsterdam, but there was a presenter, and I think it was Pitt Ford. I, I haven't had a chance to really look it up. This is years ago, obviously. We started talking about doing it as for pulpotomies and primary teeth. So I think it was a I, APD, which is the International Association of Pediatric Dentistry or the European Academy Pediatric Dentistry meeting. I heard them talk about it, and someone saying, you know, it's just Portland cement. I said, oh, my God, Portland cement? I drive past the Portland Cement Association on the Eden's Expressway in Skokie, Illinois. There's the building. I go, wow, I'll call them. I did. They were very helpful. And they connected me with Dr. Hamlin at Northwestern University, a world-renowned expert in Portland Cement, and told me all about Portland Cement. And so I started to work then on a product you guys might remember from the 90s, um, BioCal which was a powder liquid with a tricalcium, dicalcium, silicate, bismuth oxide for radio opacity, some ferric oxide. It had a pink color to it. Uh, very interestingly, it had a resin reinforced pre-polymerized particle that was where the Portland cement was pre-mixed with a hydrophilic resin, cured and crushed up to make the basis of it, along with a catalyst that had been added to that obviously in excess. So then you could put the initiator in the liquid and water solvents and polyhema, uh, which is uh, actually a very kind, um, very hydrophilic resin, was all mixed in. And we had this powder liquid and it was gonna come in a capsule. You mix it in your triturator, you can inject it in. I actually, it went through 510K, it was looking really good. And then the project was canceled because it was said that, hey, you know, in two years, we'll have a light cured formulation quote, two years, there'll be a light cure formulation of this, and no one will want to have something you have to triturate in your mixer. And I was lecturing a lot, and I ran into who became a very good friend, uh, Dr. Celio Persinotto from Brazil, who had done a lot of very interesting research in pulpotomies, and down on Rasatuba, UNESP, uh, you know, the University of uh, Sao Paulo State University. And so I got involved with a lot of research with primates at the time, not human primates specifically. And then eventually Septodon came out with biologic materials, uh, biodenting. And you, this is taken from their website 100%. I'm being fair to everyone. Biodenting is a very good product. It very similar properties to human dentin. It's radiopaque. And the only question I had on it takes 10 to 12 minutes to set. That's a real long time, especially in pediatric dentistry. You don't have time like that in pediatric dentistry. You just really don't. And so uh, that was 10 years later, though. And it's interesting because here's the powder, as you can see, they have calcium carbonate added to the tricalcium, dicalcium, silica, where everything is basically based on, right? And you have your iron oxide again in it. So uh, 
you know, basically is a, a self cure, self cure only. And I was really surprised. Like I said, that was 10 years after BioCal. I thought for sure when they first sent me some to work with it, that'd be a dual cure, but it wasn't. But it does well, and this is published in the Journal of Clinical Pediatric, I'm sorry, the Journal of Pediatric Dentistry, published this in uh, August, I believe it was, 2019. And it was a comparison between biodentin and pharmacreosol papotomies, and they followed them for two to four years. And as you see, they had a very, very high success rate with their biodentin, they were at 97.3%, and with their overall rate was 94.4%. That's really, really good, but I would have to always explain to people, these. this is a clinical trial, they're looking for ideal situations, and that's not what you find in real life. And then in real life, what I run into is, I have a patient who comes in, I start doing some class two composite restorations, and it was treatment plan three or four months ago, they've canceled their appointments, rescheduled them, and they both end up in the pulp, and I have to do pulpotomies and restorations where it really wasn't planned. I go out and I talk to a parent, and they'll say something like, oh, a well, good thing he's had a toothache here for two weeks, that's why we finally came in. And you're like, wow, great. Those are not ideal situations, right? And you never find out beforehand, it's always after. When you get done, they say, oh yeah, he's had a toothache for two weeks. So now they did place IRM on top of the biodentin, which is sort of okay, but IRM on top of the actual MTA, if they had done actual MTA instead of former creosol, that would have negatively affected the MTA. I'll tell you why later. And there are many people who would say, hey, quite frankly, those cases they did, because you see a lot of the x-rays, you know, they're barely pulp exposures. You know, you could have even gotten by leaving a little bit of decay, not exposing the pulp or doing an indirect pulp cap. Would have had a good result even with indirect pulp cap. That's really not what you run into in private practice all the time, right? So limelight, and eh, that's from pulp dent. We're really not going to talk about it a whole lot. That contains uh, calcium hydroxy appetite, sort of off the subject right now. Neo MTA. Neo MTA Plus is from Avalon Biomed. Very fine product. A lot of work has been done with that by Dr. Carolyn Primus, who is a phenomenal researcher. Uh, they have a really good product there. It's used in many pediatric dental programs as their first choice, uh, rightfully so. It's a very good product for this. Uh, it does set a little slow. It is, uh, uh, again, a self-set, self-cure material, but wonderful material. And she's done, like I said, a lot of research on things showing the level of tricalcium, dicalcium, silica in things. I'll point out like Pro Root 76%, Theracal 78%, um, Endosequence 55%. I, you know, that's, that's probably one of the reasons some people had some issues with it. And of course, Neo MTA Plus is at 72%. So you, you want to keep up in the 70 percentile of your concentration for your tricalcium, dicalcium, silicate whenever possible. And they also have their randomized clinical trial, which was published last year also in the journal Pediatric Dentistry, where they compared Neo MTA Plus to regular Pro Root MTA, and they both did quite well. Um, the only question, again, on this, and we'll talk about this, is they put IRM on top of them, which would tend to displace the MTA, the regular pro route, and errors, which I hate seeing all the time. Why wasn't this caught by an author? Why wasn't this caught by an editor? The crowns were cemented with glass ionomer cement. They said, fine, I, I buy that. Ketak bond? No, they meant Ketac Sam. They put Ketac Bond, the bonding liner. You know, seriously, when you review an article, it's the job of the editors and the reviewers and the final author to catch all those mistakes. That is a really big, blatant mistake to have published. I'm sorry. Now, we're going to talk a lot about Theracal. And the reason being is, as you probably all know, I'm on the patent application. But I have to tell you, I haven't been paid one penny for it, and that's okay. You know, a lot of stuff you do is for the research thing, and uh, that's fine. I don't, I actually, I really did this project because of 
uh, the association had with John Kanka. John Kanka, I would always argue about whether or not you, you should have a base liner. You know, I was a big believer in you should have something to replace the dentin, something that was actually biological, something biointeractive at least that would release fluoride like a glass ionomer. But he was always saying, no, you really don't need it. Just go straight to your composite because your bonding agents are very compatible. And he would refer back to a Hamling and Costa publication on all bond two all the time showing it had acceptable biocompatibility. Yes, mild inflammation, but the pulp got over it. Um, and that was all bond two, the famous publication by Hefetz and Cox et al where they took five adult monkeys, they exposed 90 teeth, they got hemostasis with sodium hypochlorite, then they used all bond two or one step and restored them. And 80%, 86% of them had tissue reorganization that was normal and form a dentin bridge. But I have to tell you again, this is not real life. These were mechanically exposed pulps and there was no bacteria involved. And what little bacteria they would have introduced, they killed with the sodium hypochlorite. You know, again, they got the hemostasis of sodium hypochlorite, that's very, very key. And the other thing is that, of course, at that time you had the research like by Franklin Tay showing that, you know, you can have odontoblastic processes right in contact with all bond to primer. And all this, was going on at the same time that you had all these publications on the cytotoxicity of certain bonding agents. They'd study them and they would, you know, expose human dentin fibroblasts and human gingival fibroblasts to these bonding agents. And there'd be huge cytotoxicity and a large number, highest number of dead cells. They find like with Scotch bond and all that. But that was only because Scotch Bond and a lot of those products, 3M products at the time, had a very high level of HEMA. And HEMA is a hydroxyethyl methacrylate. It's a highly uh, hydrophilic uh, monomer. It really penetrates into dentin. It would penetrate down. And hey, cells don't like it. You know, donoblasts don't like it. Pulpal cells don't like it. So. It was very, you know, cytotoxic, and but it increased your bond strength. And in, in the, at the time, there was a game about getting the highest bond strength you could, whether it was statistically significant or not, or clinically significant or not, made no difference. Let's go for the highest bond strength, you know. So they would pump in extra HEMA, which would then, you know, end up with causing cytotoxicity. So we had DICAL, right? But the problem with DICAL is DICAL would crumble and dissolve over a period of time if you had any micro leakage at all. And I wanted something that was compatible with like composites because everyone was doing composites. And we're, I mean, obviously composites are what we do now and at the time it was definitely the future of dentistry. So I wanted something that would sustain alkalinity over time that would not break down. And, and DICAL VLC didn't work and everyone knew it didn't work. The pH was way low compared to like DICAL. And uh, it was nowhere near as alkaline as it should be, nowhere near the calcium release. And so we worked really hard with a bunch of different chemists to develop this product that is a hydrophilic resin with lots of tricalcium, dicalcium silicate. And you could light cure it and it would still give off calcium, be very alkaline. And this is from the MSDS sheet and I get questions on this all the time. Don't believe the MSDS sheets. You don't have to give away anything that's proprietary like the resin. The resin is not published because doing so will allow other companies to copy it. The mere fact there aren't any copies is because that resin, which took many, 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 many years to work out all the bugs with and develop, isn't published. It's not listed there. It's not polyethylene glycol dimethacrylate. You don't have to actually list what it is. You just have to list what is similar enough in reactivity. And that way you don't lose proprietary information, right? And so just think about it. People say, you can't put a resin down near the pulp. Well, can you put a contact lens on your eyeball? Yes, you can. There are kind resins and there are resins that aren't kind. Like everything else in the world, it's a big difference variance, you know. So let's go to 2011 and Gandolfi and all. Many people were presenting all the research on the appetite forming ability and also on the properties 
of their cow as pulp capping agents. And these are all like presented at the International Association of Dental Research. And you see at 24 hours that Theracal produces appetite. At 28 days, a big jump appetite. You'll find in many studies the 28 day mark. Well, there's a reason for that. But at 28 days, you know if something works or not. Okay. So, but the ability to form appetite is what is defined in dentistry as being bioactive. A product is defined as bioactive in dentistry, not necessarily by the FDA, if it forms appetite in simulated body fluid at 24 hours. That's dentistry's you know, uh, description of it or definition. Uh, it's it, The FDA doesn't really see it that way, so um, we'll have to see what's going to happen down the road with that. And so, yeah, if you form appetite, that calls you, that makes you a call the bioactive material. Uh, no one likes to use that terminology because the FDA is not crazy about it. Biointeractive is a material that gives off ions. So all your glass ionomers are biointeractive because they give off fluoride ions. Now the calcium release is what causes the appetite formation, right? And if you can look at this chart, you see that this is all from Gandolfi's research, all the independent research, that actually Theracal gives off more calcium than pearl root MTA at three hours, even more at one day, less at three days, similar at seven days, more at 14 days, and a little bit more at 18 days. So you see over a period of time, you get a lot of calcium release because the material is hydrophilic. It absorbs water and it allows the tricalcium dicalcium silica to react just like it normally would. And the funny thing is, it's a continuous reaction. It doesn't end. They say with Portland cement that the building you're in, that cement it does not set completely for 100 years. And that's why your cement floors and your basement will sweat at times and cement walls will too, is that they still absorb and give off water. Same thing for the pH. If you look at the pH of it, pearl root's a little bit more alkaline at one day, about the same. I'm sorry, at three hours, about the same at one day. Uh, it's a little bit more at three days, a little bit more again at seven days, but 14 days, Theracal is more alkaline. So it kind of all works out. And one of the big thoughts, early thought processes was this, is that it's evening out these slopes. It's flattening the curve. So it must be good, right? When you flatten the curve, it must be good. So Gandolfi and other people have published, you know, articles like this is International Endodontic Journal saying, hey, this really releases a lot of calcium. It's very alkaline, so you should be able to do it. Unfortunately, they put the depth of 1.7 millimeters, which is by far the maximum, and you don't want to do that. You want to keep it like one millimeter. The LC, the light cure, should be kept at one millimeter thickness. You can always add another millimeter and light cure again. But there's no real reason to. One millimeter is really good for Theracal LC. That's all you need for the level. And we know about the biocompatibility because right away, Hebling and Costa, in this case, just Costa, uh, they're a wonderful couple, by the way, Costa and Hebling, biomaterialists out of Brazil, a wonderful people to talk to. And I have the greatest respect for both of them. They're very excellent biomaterialists, both of them. And Dr. Costa had published this. We look at the cytotoxic effects of pulp capping agents using immortalized cells, utilizing the immortalized odontoblastic cell line, which is really important, okay? Because you have to check this stuff before you get it on the market. You got to make sure it's not cytotoxic, right? So he looked at Theracal LC, Ultra Blend Plus, Vitrobond, and of course the Dobecos. Modify Eagle medium, which is the cell culture medium. It's what you grow these cells in, and that's considered your control, okay? So that's your control right there. And what he found was really fascinating because Theracal by far represent the lowest decrease in cell metabolic activity. And they do this by measuring the health of the mitochondria. You know, all my research I do with mitochondria. So it's very exciting to see research like this for dentistry. And so basically they looked at the level of succinate dehydrogenase production. They said, wow, these cells are actually fairly healthy. They're not growing bad at all, much better than vitrobon, which is, you know, cytotoxic. So vitrobon, you're okay if you leave at least a millimeter of dentin to buffer the effects of it. But if you put it right on the pulp, it can really hammer the pulp. So you have to be careful of things like that. And total protein expression to Theracal presented the lowest suppression of the total cell protein expression. 
So let's look at some of the primate research which I, I was very involved with. And I, as you know, I've done several studies, animal studies with pulps, uh, pulp studies using uh, non-human primates like the Cebus apella shown here, using swine like for the laser study, the ferric sulfate studies, and the MTA studies. And we wanted to see what it looked like in a true good model. We did it down in Arasatuba, the birthplace of the baby clinicas of Brazil, which have now seen over one in their, all the baby clinicas there have seen over one million babies, you know, age six months, a year, and the eruption of the first teeth. And they have beautiful research on how you really do prevention. And I laud them. I have tons of respect for what they've done. So let's look at what we did. We did these little buckle preparations and we exposed the pulp, okay? And we used Cebus apella. Cebus apella are actually in the same branch as we are. They're not, uh, they're very, they're new world monkeys, but they're strongly related to the African great apes and how they are. They're 98% DNA match to, to humans. So it's very interesting monkey to use. And we had uh, four treatment groups and four monkeys. They were all randomized. Each quadrant was different with Theracal, Pure Portland Cement, uh, Glass Anomer, and VLC Dical. And so I'll go through this very quickly because I want to get to the clinical. So results were, yeah, we had very little inflammation with the Theracal LC and the MTA. We had good, which was a Portland Cement. We had good hard tissue bridge formation up close. You can see odontoblastic-like cells lining the dentin bridge. And we were very, very happy. Glass anomers did as we thought they would. Again, lots of inflammation, vacuoles, some scar tissue, very poor bridge formation, just a lot of scar tissue forming there. VLC dical also some Poor dentin bridge formation. Again, not enough calcium, not alkaline enough to be a good pulp capping agent. That's why it's really not indicated for that. Some inflammatory vacuoles and infiltrate. And these are pretty representative slides of the whole thing. And measuring the hard tissue bridge formation at three different places, at three different sections at 28 days, which is what was the FDA guidelines on this. We found that we had, you know, the Portland cement, the MTA was better, but statistically the same as the Theracal and the glass cyanomer and the Dical were almost exactly the same in their hard tissue bridge formation. And here's the statistical analysis on it. And three sections measured at three different areas, exactly as how you're supposed to do it for the FDA. And at the time, we were the first study to actually follow the FDA recommendations of it. And we were also the first study to use micro CT. So we can look at it three dimensionally with Dr. Stuart Stock from Northwestern. And this was all done blind, of course, utilizing his micro CT unit, as you see there at Northwestern, to form these really wonderful three-dimensional images of the bridge formation. And that is published. That's published in Journal of Clinical Pediatric Dentistry. So if guys, you want to read up on it, just look at this article. You can read up on the research behind it. Now, there was another study I was partially involved with, just as consulting at first. I was lecturing in in uh, Korea at Yonsei University, which is a really wonderful university. The quality of care there is just absolutely amazing. And they wanted to do a pulpotomy study. So I said, yes, well, I'll arrange for you to have some uh, Theracal DC, now known as PT, so we can use a dual cure and do an actual pulpotomy, not a pulp capping study. And they were going to do it with pigs. And I was really excited because we were we're starting to use pigs at Northwestern at that time too. Really excited to have it done. And then when they came out, they didn't quite do that. They used dogs and because of an issue with pigs, but dogs aren't the right study model. Their teeth aren't formed correctly at all. That's why we don't use them for pulp studies. You can use them for trauma. They don't heal the same as humans for pulp studies. Or they found that out to Holland and Souza or Holland and D'Souza from Brazil found that out years ago, I think it was 2001, that they were really bad models to try to do pulpotomies in because of the pulp with chambers. And then they came back with results showing the Theracal LC caused some irritation, not bad, but some. And it's because of the inverse square law. See, the inverse square law says if you're a millimeter away, 
and then you go to three millimeters away, when you're at three millimeters away, you get one-ninth the radiation energy to that same area, right? You know, inverse square. And this is really bad because of those tall pulp horns, uh, pulp horns they went into, they went all the way down to make a pulp, they still had those tall cusps. And they even said it too, and I'll show you that to you, that their results aren't bad for Theracal LC, but supposed to be Theracal PT had been a lot better because it would have dual cured, much better than IRM, as you can see there, right? Much better than the control IRM, but not as good as ProRoot MTA or Retro MTA, which is their product. Um, and this is what they said, it's in quotes, you won't have a chance to read the whole thing, but they did say previous in vivo study by Canon had all used pulp capping models and primate teeth with better access to the curing light because we did our pulp exposures from the buckle and we can get right there and cure it. Uh, they did a full pulpotomy, which meant they had to go all the way down in those flared out roots. They were down like eight, nine, 10 millimeters and they couldn't actually light cure it down those little tunnels, which we have done a study to prove that was the case too. And that allowed there to be some unset monomers. And then I said to him, well, I'll send you some dogs that have human teeth and you can do the study again. But we don't use dogs. It's very controversial to use man's best friend anyway, but they don't react the same. So you, you have to really be careful about dog studies in general. Retrieval study has been very good. I won't show you the slides on it because of time, but I've retrieved over a thousand teeth. A thousand primary molars have been restored. And we've looked at many of them, not all of them. There's never been enough time to. And uh, we looked at the healing after pulp exposures, and these are teeth that have been treated like this one. There's small pulp exposure, it gets Theracal LC, and then the tooth exfoliates four years later, five years later, and we can section and look at the healing and look at the hypermineralized zones and all the stuff like that. The wider area see is the Theracal LC. And, you know, papotomy, the PT, we can look at that. This tooth we had to extract later because of ectopic eruption. And they had ectopic eruption everywhere, though. These were orthodontic extractions, so not related to the papotomy. There is a close-up of the crown. That's a zirconium crown. I want you to see how nice that margin looks on that. I did this morning three zirconium crowns on an emergency case I had to treat in the operating room. So needed extractions and everything. The poor kid had a lot of infection. So this is a typical situation. A young man comes in, he has constant sensitivity, the cold and the hot, spontaneous pain in this tooth. He's a young guy and this amalgam had just been done not too long ago. This is a young, young man. And someone had just done an amalgam and they adjusted the occlusion by filling it up and having him biting down hard. And you can see the opposing cusp imprinted into the amalgam. So I had to take pictures of this, right? So I slid this on, I said, let's take out and see what's going on. And the dical underneath had dissolved. The amalgam flew out. It was not well condensed at all, naturally. And of course, you know, there was no rubber dam on because of how they adjust the occlusion, right? And then underneath, you can see a lot of stain. I left that stain there so you can see where it had leaked all around. And then I removed all the very soft you know, mush that was underneath the dical. The dical was very mushy and all that. And so I placed Theracal PT there. And what I do is I etch the enamel for 30 seconds and I etch the dentin for three seconds, which really upsets some people. They say, place the Theracal, then etch. And yes, that's what's in the instructions. So follow the instructions and do that. But there you have your Theracal. Um, PT, the dual cure, because it's deep, I want it to work as a base and it continues to dual cure. So I don't have to worry about how deep I place it, right? And that's because of this commutative continuous calcium release. It has a hydrophilic, like I mentioned, matrix there. So it gives this material lots of usage. It was originally supposed to be called Theracal DC as a dual cure. And they're afraid people might get confused by that, so they changed the name to Theracal PT. But if you look at the research and any articles published early, you might say Theracal DC. But you have this really great calcium release that continues. And is it kind on, on the pulp? Yes. Work done by John Mitchell and all when he has up in Seattle, University of Washington, where he looked at odontoblastic 
21 cells. Again, these are immortalized odontoblasts. These are actually murine immortalized odontoblasts. And they made samples of Theracal LC, Theracal DC, which is now PT, Therabag 65, which is uh, Theracal using uh, bioactive glass. And then they took these cells and they took the extracted media that they made from diluting all these materials into the media from getting an extract from this these materials and they expose the cells once or twice and they would check them different groups at up to three days or four days and they would grow them out and it was really fascinating because none of them were detrimental to the odontoblastic 21 cells so they really weren't cytotoxic. They might have inhibited slightly at stages but very slightly. I'll show you this, the actual graphs right here from his presentation that John Mitchell did, who is a biomaterialist. And so you can see there, at, actually at day three for the PT and for the Theraglass, that they actually had an increased growth of dodonoblastic cells over what they would normally grow like in the regular media in the control media. So, wow, that's never been shown before in dentistry. That's a first. So it actually encouraged the growth, and that was very, very positive. So I know that this is biocompatible. So this was restored utilizing you know, all bond universal, Activa restorative, and I used single tooth anesthesia to do it. And there's a le little bleeding from flossing afterwards and the rubber dam clamp. But he was very happy, no sensitivity afterwards, all completely went away. Of course, he was really happy he had um, a and, and composite and sieve amalgam. He was only, I can't remember if he was like 14 or 12 or something like that. I know this molar had just come in behind. And so they tell all their friends, this is what you have with social media, right? They like to tell everyone about when they have a great experience. They love the fact his face wasn't numb, he go right back to school too. And that's the beauty of single tooth anesthesia. One pet peeve I have, a very strong pet peeve, is how people combine materials inappropriately. Um, calcium fluoride is insoluble. Look it up. You can look it up everywhere. Calcium fluoride is insoluble. The FDA does not allow you to have calcium fluoride as an actual ingredient in toothpaste because it does nothing. If you put active calcium and fluoride together with water in a toothpaste, you'll automatically combine to make calcium fluoride. MI Paste Plus from GC uses a small amount of fluoride. It's 880, I think it is, parts per million fluoride. But it's amorphous calcium phosphate, you know, so it doesn't quite combine readily with the fluoride. And there's very little water to inhibit the set of it. So I'd be lecturing all over, and I'd be hearing people go, oh, I love Theracal LC. I put it in, and I cover it with Vitrobon. I go, what a waste of time and money. There's absolutely no reason to do that. There's no reason to do that. And if you place the Theracal properly, it stays in place. You have to a little bit of moisture there. It loves that little bit of moisture. It adheres fine, like cured. Go ahead and restore the tooth. And so I was wondering, what happens when you put fluoride release on top of Theracal? And I presented this actually in Fort Lauderdale two years ago, right? And we made these samples. Um, the samples are 20 millimeters wide and one millimeter thick. And we made them, then we would coat them either a Vitrobon or Vitrobon and a bulk fill or just Vitrobon and bulk fill and the Theracal LC. So we had three different groups there. And we also made sheer bond strength samples. I wanted to see what it did to the overall strength of the materials when you did this, because, you know, Vitrobon does not bond well to composite. It has to weaken it. And sure enough, of course, it does. It makes it weaker, without a doubt, right? The sheer bond strength drops when you add Vitrobon to it. If you just do Theracal, All Bond Universal, and Reveal Bulk Fill, you have a much stronger, much stronger system. But also, look at the difference in the bond, the shear bond strength is pretty significant. But you have a big, huge increase in the calcium release as opposed to what happens when you do the Vitrobon. The Vitrobon greatly reduces the calcium. And you notice the Vitrobon because if you take the reveal off the top of the Vitrobon, it reduces it even more. And so what happens is when you look using your calcium electrode and you look in the solution for calcium, you just won't find it because it's now calcium fluoride. 
So the conclusion is the overlying RMGI reduces the calcium release of the thericol significantly, but also the thericol calcium release reduces the fluoride release of the RMGI. So you're making them both not work, which would be exactly the same if you did dical. So if you put vitropon on top of dical, like half the dental schools teach, neither one is working well. That's why you need to make sure materials are biocompatible. And just something simple you can do, or just compatible, I should say. Something simple you can do yourself if you want to. It's just order on Amazon for five bucks some pH strips, right? And you take those pH strips, you measure the pH of your you know, etchant, and your etchant should be pretty, you know, acidic, right? pH of like one to two, as you can see here, we're measuring the pH with it, right? About one to two is the pH, which is, you expect, very acidic, right? Yeah, no big deal. So you look at this bioactive base liner, because it releases some fluoride, not much calcium, uh, not much fluoride, but, you know, there's some being released. Um, and you look at it, and you look at its pH, and its pH is about 3 to 4. Oh, wait a second. It's actually 3.6. I thought you wanted to be really alkaline. I thought you would want a base to be calcium-releasing. Uh, I'm a little confused here, aren't you? That doesn't seem right. Let's look at Fuji 2LC, which is a very fine material, by the way, and actually very, you know, uh, the active is a good material too. I'm just having kind of fun with it right now. Um, but if you look at the pH, it's again between three and four, which you know this. Look it up in the literature. It's an acid base reaction going on. It's a resin modified glass ionomer. It's going to be acidic. It's not the world's best base, but it has a significant release of fluoride, which is nice, right? That's nice to have a significant release of fluoride. And if you didn't use a calcium releasing base underneath it, you'd be okay. Um, but you shouldn't use both. You should make up your decision, make up your mind which way you're going to go, right? And there you go again, the pH about three to four. And there you have Theracal. Okay, now we're talking apples, bananas, and peaches, and oranges. We're talking completely different because if you take it, and you can do this yourself with a wet pH strip, you look at the pH of it, it's around 12, which is what is published in the literature pH of around 12, 11.6, 11.8, it's alkaline, and it gives off lots of calcium. No one has ever said anything else except for salespeople, detailed salespeople. So it's kind of like, I said apple, oranges, bananas, it's more like lagers, porters, ales, you know, and, and pilsners. And I was lecturing at a dental school. This is at LSU, as you can tell, to the sophomore, junior, and senior classes about rare diseases and the treatment in dentistry. And they asked me, hey, you know, we see that you um, did a lot of the research developing Theracal LC. But we'd like to use it, one student said, but we can't in the school. And I said, well, why can't you use it? They go, well, because it has acidic monomers. I said, oh, really? Acidic? What's the pH of it? They all kind of looked at each other. I said, well, it's, it's over 11. You can test this yourself. You can look it up in the literature. Everyone Google it on your phone. They start Googling it. Oh, yeah, it's around 11. Where is the acidic monomers coming in at? There are no acidic monomers in it. It can't have acidic monomers or it would be acidic. That's kind of really ridiculous. I asked, what do you use instead of Vitrobon? which is acidic and does have acidic monomers. So I hope you enjoyed the laugh there because, you know, again, uh, different institutions I lecture at, like UAB, I ran into John Burgess a few years ago after lecturing. I said, hey, not only that, Dical and Vitrobon don't work together well. Many studies have shown that. He goes, yes, there's always a big gap between. Yes, there's always a mush zone in between. And so we actually did a study on it, looking at the mush zone between Dical and Vitrobon. And as it turns out, Vitrobon does not set well because the it's an acid-base reaction. You put it on top of something very alkaline, you know, trying to neutralize the acid in it, right? That doesn't work. And, of course, the dical set is inhibited even more because the solicit set won't set because of the effect of the vitrobon on top. So that's like, well, double whammy. They always have a gap. You always have no bond strength there. You always have leakage there. 
period. Now, if you go and put the composite directly on top of the diacal and cure it, the diacal just splits apart, and everyone knows, because the diacal is so weak, it, when it polymerizes, it just pulls apart the diacal. Again, that's a real problem, and everyone knows you can't do that, and that's the reason we developed Therca LC, is it doesn't rip apart. It has a bond strength of 15.0, plus or minus four megapascals. If you want to read up on this, it was uh, presented at the Academy of Dental Materials at the meeting uh, five years ago in Maui. So we have all that presented there. And it's not just, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at people like Josette Camilleri, uh, an incredible researcher. She's at the University of Birmingham right now. I've sent her my semi-retrieval samples to work with. Um, she often has published and, and things like in dental materials, top journals, saying, hey, you got to look at what you use for liners and bases and the permanent restorative material and make sure they work together before you just start using them like here she looked at mta and she put like calcium hydroxide products on top that was fine but when she put a glass ionomer on top it was not good it was a really bad scene and the same thing with irm on top of mta and there's people who teach that but you got to read the literature and this is a quote again you see in quotes from the article zinc oxide eugenol based cement should be avoided in the presence of mta and glass armor cements should be avoided because they increase the porosity and, and they cause incomplete hydration of the MTA. So they're really not a good idea. What I do is uh, I like to place, you know, you can put Theracal PT on top. If you want to put MTA in, the, put the Theracal PT on top. It's not going to hurt it at all, right? So in fact, since it's 70, some odd percent MTA, it's a marriage made in heaven. You can actually even get by with something like Tempet from Centrix, which is a calcium sulfate product, because again, it's not going to hurt it. So there are options. There are there's there's ways of doing it properly, and that's what I'm just encouraging. And look at the clinical studies. This is again dental materials. This is from five years ago. This is a published uh, publication uh, an article that research was done at the University of Turin, and they looked at these uh, cases. They had a direct pulp caps. They used like cured MTA. They're talking about Theracal. And here's the results. They had 60 teeth, 20 in each group. They had 20 that were treated, group one, where they had pulp exposure with an adhesive system, which was from Curare. They then, in group two, used Fuji 9 from GC, glass ionomer. In group three, they used Theracal LC from Bisco, and then these two little pulp caps right here. After two years, group one were vital at 83.3%. Hey, that's really pretty good. But that's, you know, that's a really nice adhesive material, Karari, it's very kind. Group two, 66.6%. A third of them became necrotic. You know, glass anomers are very irritating. You gotta be careful with those glass anomers close to the pulp. And in group three, 93.3%. This is a clinical study. I'll show you some more too. You got to use it as direct Therica LC indications, liner and base, alternative to calcium hydroxide, i.e., diacal, an alternative to RMGI, IRM, ZOE, not to be used with as an alternative because it's an alkaline pH and forms appetite. So that's important. When they say LC, pulp capping, yes. Don't use it for a pulpotomy. That's what we'll be trying to tell people. There's important concepts here. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. In more bioactivity, maybe less stability. More resorbability, less, you know, you'll end up with dissolvability. Calcium release versus mechanical strength. If you have a lot of lots of calcium coming out, you have very poor mechanical strength. You have to balance everything. And it took years, but that was a success story in balancing, right? And let's look at University of uh, Michigan, Ann Arbor School of Dentistry. Let's look at their retrospective study. They just had some people say, I want to use Theracal. The other people say, oh, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use Diacal. I'll show you years down the road. We'll see who has the best result. So they had 60 patients for each material. And those 69 teeth with calcium hydroxide, 79 teeth using Theracal LC. You can read up about this, too. Drip pulp capping success for calcium hydroxide, diacal was 50%, and for theracal, 69%. Oh, hmm. 
based on this data, Theracal may be considered to be an equivalent treatment to calcium hydroxide for both direct and indirect pulp capping materials. Again, independent study, not sponsored by anybody. So let's go on and we'll end really quickly here, another five minutes or so, so we have questions. Another clinical case here, history of severe dental apprehension, of course, that's why they were referred. Mother only wants to have natural products, of course, another reason to refer them. And then number three, reason is always they have no more money left, that's another reason. As a specialist, I have fun saying that. But I always confirm to the parents, I don't use anything that's not natural. I only use natural products. And I really, truly believe that because, yeah, I don't use anything supernatural ever since 1980, Stanley Kubrick's classic, The Shining. I've been afraid of the supernatural. I'm afraid of the twins in the hallway or some beautiful lady getting out of a bathtub who then turns into a rotten hag. How little did I know that was a prophecy for married life? But anyway, in life, the dose makes the poison, right? You know, a lot of different materials have chemicals in them that in the wrong dosage can be poison. I mean, that's just what you find. The dose makes the poison. I think every dentist should have this poster up in their office, by the way, because people get concerned about little tiny things and don't worry about hacking next to the person who has uh, COVID-19, right? And so now they have returned. Speaking of COVID-19, the twins came and they stole everyone's toilet paper. That's really scary, isn't it? So, of course, it was in the pulp as expected. It's very important always, 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 always to get hemostasis. If you can't get hemostasis, you get a problem with that pulp. Always try to get hemostasis. It means it's not actually you're not doing a vital pulpotomy. It's really a lot of non-vital tissue there. And what's good for hemostasis is ferric sulfate. Ferric sulfate gives hemostasis. It is not antimicrobial. It does not kill one bacteria. I can show you actual studies on that. No, it doesn't help with a pulpotomy. It just stops bleeding. So what you put on top is very important, right? And so what I always do is I treat with sodium hypochlorite. I highly recommend that sodium, sodium hypochlorite, if you can buy it now, is a step that some people have neglected to do in the past. You need to go into sodium hypochlorite to really disinfect, to dissolve the clots. If you don't, you're gonna have regrowth of the bacteria. Get removed, remove those pulpal tags, and use a good one. Go ahead and get it from Vista Dental Products. Get, you know, a good medical grade sodium hypochlorite. And again, you know, if you take that out, there's no bleeding, you got a vital pulp that you're doing. And you gotta remove the excess sodium hypochlorite. You know, the only problem is, uh, don't do this if you have problems with your water supply because water supply problems have caused so many issues in dentistry. I love that photo. I love how the water looks alive and fluid there. And she goes, I love that photo. That's one of my favorite photos. And this is what it should look like. This is what a vital pulpotomy looks like. You see the vital pink? Yeah, it's not bleeding, it's vital. This will work. Now you have what's essential. You can go ahead and place your pulpal dressing. This is Theracal PT, cured, cured Theracal. It's biologically kind from all the work done on DC, right? And in it, of course, you have that special hydrophilic matrix and you have the calcium, dicalcium silicate, where it's releasing the calcium ions the whole time, making it being alkaline, which inhibits the growth of all the pathogens. You like cure, but because it's dual cure, it'll continue the cure, which is very important because you cannot have any uncured monomer at the bottom there. It cannot happen. Now you can go ahead and etch and restore the tooth. And a lot of times, because I'm making a monoblock here, this is gonna be very durable. So I can do it with a composite in a situation like this. So I go ahead, I've obturated the pulpal chamber. The pulpal chamber is completely filled with a Theracal PT, which has good mechanical properties. I've got the adhesive on top. I've cured the adhesive, which further cures the Theracal PT. And now I can inject in a dual cure bulk fill material in there. Inject that. You can tease it around to make sure there's no voids and then pulps cure that, you see? And remove your matrix and wedge, and I place some gross anatomy in that. I mean, it looks really good, and it's a monoblock. So it's very durable. I didn't need to do a crown on it. And I only do mostly zirconium crowns anyway. 
And so this is kind of cool to do with this. And this is another postoperative visit on the kid down the road, you know, and, and we followed these for years and I try to retrieve them so I can look at them. But you can see how nice the margins are. You can see how great. This is not exactly the same case, unfortunately, but a similar case where you can see the monoblock on the bottom, which is such a great x-ray. I, I, I had to show that to you, you know, the, how they can look. And, and again, you know, schematically, you have your carious exposure, you take out the pulp, you get hemostasis, ferric sulfate, or just go in there with sodium hypochlorite pellets like I did today in the operating room and place your Theracal PT. Then you can restore the tooth with any good bulk fill or put a crown on it, you know, another big option. And we can show right here, last clinical case real quick. You have carious first and second primary molars. You go in, you get a pulp exposure in the first molar. It's deep, but not a pulp exposure in the second molar. And so what are you going to do? Well, you go ahead and you get your sodium hypochlorite in there for hemostasis. Meanwhile, I placed a wedge, a matrix in. I go ahead and I put the Theracal PT in the deep part of the second molar, and I can go ahead and then load up the uh, first molar, take out the pellets of the sodium hypochlorite, load that up, and like your them both again, right? So you're killing two birds with one stone, then do a composite in the second molar, and do a zirconium and crown in the first molar, and there you go. Of course, it's bleeding because I just did it, but you know I got some post stops I have to put in here because it looks really good. And then we have trauma. And trauma is something where this really shines. You get a pulp exposure of less than one hour duration. I saved the fragments, hollowed out the fragment. Uh, previous trauma, you can see the other tooth adjacent has showed shortened roots from that. Um, so I went ahead and placed the Theracal in there. I'm going pretty quick right now. And you put the um, fragment back on, you bond it back on because of the looseness of the teeth and the history of the previous trauma of those two. I splinted it with some glass span, which is great splinting material. And then this is two years later, she's in orthodontics. And this is four years later, post orthodontics. And if you look real careful, you can see where I did put the fragment on. Because of course, when the orthodontist went ahead and polished it after taking off the brackets, he polished down some enamel exposed my beveling I had done, but there is the tooth at four years. Are there limitations? Heck yes. I mean, leaky restorations, infected dentin, misuse, misapplication. I get cases sent to me where the Theracal is pink because it's bleeding into the Theracal. It's not going to work. You know, you can't raise the dead. This is not like Lazarus. You're not going to raise the dead by placing Theracal products in all. And there is some concern for cytotoxicity in some studies because of aluminum. This is a great one published in Human Experimental Toxicology, looking at MTA Angelus, MTA Philippex, Theracal LC on rats where they extracted the right central incisor. Then they placed in tubes with the materials. They checked at 7, 30, and 60 days. And they said, hey, we find that there's actually aluminum affecting the brain from these materials right away with the MTA Angelus because very rapid release of the aluminum. We're very, very confused by this. There is no aluminum in Theracal LC, none zip. That material has um, the uh, tricalcium, dicalcium silicate is actually um, made uh, synthetically pure. So it, there's, it doesn't come from Portland cement. Uh, what we're thinking is that that aluminum, that might be a knockoff um, from a certain country then they knock off and make uh, counterfeit and they may have just use uh, Portland. So it's interesting on that. Anyway, I want to thank you all so very much. You can email me at markcannon at northwestern.edu. You can Skype me at docmlc. These are my five kids. That's my favorite picture of all. It's a very, very old picture, by the way. Three boys, two girls. Um, that's oldest son, he was in Korea, there he is in Afghanistan, 101st Airborne, middle son at his wedding, an officer's wedding. He's 12th Aviation right now, but he was 10th Mountain Division. There they're cutting the cake with an officer's saber. When he got his wings, he's a Black Hawk pilot. Oldest daughter, degree in psychology. Two sons, my grandsons, Henry and Luke. And of course, here's some more family pictures. Us dancing her wedding. Blackhawks flying, Chris 
on his uh, first tour in Afghanistan, coming back from first tour with my daughter-in-law, extremely happy to be home after first tour. Of course, he went back again. And the only time you saw him happier is when you saw his dog, Penny, and of course, at my oldest daughter's wedding. There's all of them right there. And youngest daughter is a pediatric ICU nurse now, very, very busy. And youngest son is going for his graduate degree in philosophy of uh, physics. So I want to thank you so very, very much. And I'm going to look over here now for questions. And uh, I tried to keep that exactly at one hour. So let's see. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can read all these questions here. It's kind of hard to get them all to pop up. So, okay, I'm trying to make it bigger so I can see everything. Hi, sorry, I couldn't understand the difference between the application of Theracal for pulp capping and for pulpotomy. Okay, Theracal LC is light cured. It's great for indirect, direct pulp capping as stated in the instructions for use. Theracal PT is dual cured. Everything has to do with curing. 80% of the posterior composites in the United States are supposedly undercured, and that is a major, major issue. And so that's why dual cure is really good for um, anything deep, like if you were to do a deep distal box on something. So here, I'm going to try to bring up another one. How effective this with primary teeth using sodium hypochlorite and Theracal PT? Well, so far, in everything I've seen from studies coming in, it's been effective. I myself have not had any problems. Um, but, you know, again, I can I get really picky. I, I worry because there's people in practice who never use a rubber dam, even for pulpotomies. And, you know, with anything like Theracal PT, technique is very, very, very important. Um, because especially if you're doing a composite on top. So that's why I would say, yeah, you know, for the people who are doing it correctly, they're not having any problems at all. Do I have a radiograph on the trauma case? Yes, I do, Ashley. I don't have it in the lecture. Um, I am. I apologize. This is like a three-hour lecture. I took out two-thirds of it. Is limelight similar in properties to the light cure version of Theracal? No. And I love my friends at Pulp Dent. The owners, the Burks, and all those guys are great people. But it's a calcium hydroxyapatite. It's not a tricalcium, dicalcium silica. And the resin is nowhere near as hydrophilic. Now, they have a great hydrophilic resin with Embrace. But Limelight actually has been replaced. They have a replacement for Limelight. You may want to look into the image of post and some pairs. Uh, would I be willing to share this? I think it's a great one, you know, about zucchini containing formaldehyde. Yeah, you know, it's like eating off your carpet. You don't want to do that right away, do you? What are your opinions of immediate dents and sealing after direct, indirect pulp capping of permanent teeth? Um, basically, if you place Theracal LC in and cover it with a good seventh generation or universal adhesive, it will immediately seal everything. Now, let's look at Albon Universal for that, just, just to throw that out, okay? Um, it goes on hydrophilic. When you like your, it becomes hydrophobic, so it forms a barrier. And when you have that barrier, that calcium release from the tricalcium, dicalcium, silicon goes straight down. And it's a good thing it forms a barrier because when it becomes hydrophobic, you put a hydrophobic composite on top. So, Always remember, you can't mix systems. If you do something hydrophilic, it's going to like something hydrophilic on top. Or you have to form a medium, some type of bridging material in between. So that's the whole idea on that. What's your take on Activa from Alpten? It's great for primary dentition. I absolutely, totally love it in the primary dentition. I have extremely high success rate with it. My composites, very high. I, Literally, I could do another study, and I have done studies, clinical studies, where we've gone in and we data mined all the information out, and, and the success rates going to be in the high 90 percentiles without failures. It's, you know, isolation, removing decay, prep design, good bonding materials. Activa can wear in some people, 
in some people, it wears pretty fast. Um, so what I do is I use Activa as a dentin replacement in people where I see wear. And I use a super hybrid on top that'll prevent the wear. You know, I, I love Estelite, you know, Sigma Quick from Tokiyama. I'm just being very honest with you. I, it's like one of my favorite composites and it just doesn't wear. So yeah, guys, if you want to make something last a long time, just do that. What's your opinion about Clearfill as a direct capping agent? Well, again, with Clearfill, you're not going to get any calcium release. It's not going to be alkaline. So yeah, Curare actually makes some really nice products and you, I think you're referring to a Curare product right now, but the, um, it's, you, you don't get the same success rate as you do something that is alkaline, that's for sure. So you're based on the findings, are you suggesting to not layer uh, an RMGI on top of Theracal? Okay, be real careful with thinking that Activa is a true RMGI that it's a resin modified glass anomer. It's more of a resin based composite. Remember the old compromer? Now I'm not saying this is a polyacid modified. The thing is, Activa is a dual cured resin based composite that uses glass anomer filler particles that have been greatly milled down. So you do, and it's a hydrophilic resin. So you can get pulling out of it some of the um, fluoride and so on. And that does make it somewhat acidic, but it's not like an RMGI like you would find with uh, Fuji 2LC. Okay, now Fuji, the new Fuji, the um, direct fill Fuji that came out that was called Automix LC, that one, is still more of a resin modified glass anomer. It has more of that in it and less composite. So you're at these gray zones. So Activa is more like a resin based composite with some, like I mentioned, glass anomer fillers in it. And I worked heavily on that at the very, very, very beginning when it was actually a product for another company. Would you be willing to share the image, the post of pairs? Well, that's the same question. Boy, we've got that several times now. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to go all the way up to more questions. Let's see if there's more. Great topic. Please clarify. Um, Theracal placed um, pulp exposure versus as a liner. Well, pulp exposure, um, again, you can just use it for small pulp exposure and you can get a light to it. And you can light cure it. Use the LC. It's very, very easy. Um, and then you can go directly to a dentin replacement. You know, do your Activa on top of it. Um, it's not going to greatly inhibit it, okay? And and it'll bond well together. I've actually had wonderful, uh, wonderful section of teeth showing the bond, and I've sent those off to places like University of Tennessee, Memphis, and others, where they've looked at that under SEM and so forth. So um, let's see what else they have here. We got here. Okay. Okay, to which, I'm curious as to which universal adhesive you'd recommend that isn't detrimental to the dentin with high HEMA and expensive bond strength. Um, actually, all the new adhesives are really good. I mean, if you look at 3M, they're all 10 MDP based, pretty much. The only one that isn't is dense flights, right? Prima Bond NT, the only one that really isn't. But if you were to look at GCs, Viscos, um, 3M, they're now based on 10 MDP, which is a monomer that was Curare's and the patent has expired. And so that's why um, many people are using it. It gives you really good bond strength and it's nowhere near as cytotoxic. They all still have a little HEMA in them. The whole thing with it, if you get it fully polymerized, the HEMA becomes non-toxic. So that's the key, you know, it's when it's not fully polymerized, you have the issue with it. So you can get down there and polymerize it really well. It becomes non-toxic. And that's why having all this cross uh, polymerization was important, like adding GC and Bisco added pentafunctional monomers that would have them highly cross-linked and they would take up all those available 
uh, double bonds and it would make it go from being hydrophilic to hydrophobic. And then you don't have any dissolution of any onset monomer that can get into it because it's trapped within the matrix, the resin matrix. Yeah, not similar to the matrix that Keenan Reeves was trapped in a different matrix than that. So let's see here, uh, what is pulp vitality? Well, uh, we're talking about good vital pulp tissue, so something that's not hemorrhagic and dying, uh, irreversible pulpitis we want to avoid. So everybody, I think we're at the end of the questions. We've gone on a little long, and I really appreciate all of that, and uh, you guys have asked a lot of really wonderful questions, and I just encourage you to read up a lot and join some of the really good organizations that really discuss this because um, it's it, it's amazing when you go and you hear the propaganda from salespeople about like I got this three second curing like you find out when you go to like Academy of Dental Materials that there there are no such thing. There are no three-second curing lights. And when you actually do studies, like I've done a number of studies, and you can look at the publications, um, that they, you go to a lab, you test something, that lab test does not represent what you're going to see in real life very often. Well, with that, I want to thank you all so very, very much. And stay safe. Um, stay quarantined. Um, enjoy any beautiful weather that's coming up. And again, thank you so much for your attendance.